Welcome to Notes on Nature TV. I'm Jamie. And I'm Jenny. Coming up in this episode, we've got broadcaster and naturalist Mike Dilger and Scala radio presenter and bird enthusiast Simon Mayo talking to us about Big Garden Bird Watch. But my favourite bird, Jamie, has to be the bullfinch. And it's a bird I always hear before I see. It's got a pew, pew, pew call. And once you learn that call, you know it's coming in. I love the fact that they're so common and yet they have the greatest song of all. I mean, I, I know there are other songbirds that can probably be more show-offy, but I love the blackbird probably more than any other. Miranda Kristofnikov, TV broadcaster and RSPB president, has got the latest news from her kestrel cam. So we've got the male kestrel at the back of the nest box and the female has just flown in now. Um, I haven't seen the two of them in the nest box together for about two or three weeks, so this is really exciting. Now, our gardens might be looking a bit soggy and bleak at the moment, but there are still things we can do outside at this time of year to help nature. Our wildlife gardening expert, Adrian Thomas, has a tip for us. You'll often hear me going on about the importance of a log pile for wildlife, which is great when you've got something like this, which I can see is covered in springtails and wood lice and millipedes. But what if you don't have logs? And Luke introduces us to a bird that sometimes visits gardens, the grey wagtail. Admittedly, it is a fairly scarce visitor, but they do turn up fairly frequently across the whole of the UK. And it's a bird that we often get told about because it is quite an unusual one. First, let's have a look in the digital mailbag at some of the photos you've sent in. First up, we've got this fantastic great tip from Michael Batley. I don't have any snow at the moment and haven't had all month, so I'm quite jealous of that alone. It's a lovely shot, isn't it? And, and actually, I think the great tip is sheltering there from the elements in the in that handle of a fork or a spade or something. It's a it's a beautiful shot. And, and these are birds that we are going to be hearing quite a bit from, I think, over the next couple of months because they are one of the early nesters, aren't they? Yeah, you're right. I've actually started hearing quite a few birds piping up recently, which is lovely, a kind of sign of spring being around the corner. And great tits, um, we often say they sound like they're saying teacher, teacher, teacher. Or you can also compare it with a bit of a, um, I suppose, a squeaky gate that someone is annoying you by <laughs> swinging back and forth. Yeah, that's right. My dad always said it sounds like a squeaky wheelbarrow. So that's definitely one to look out for. Um, a, an easily recognisable bird with its really bold yellow uh, front with a black stripe going down the middle and that black and white head. Uh, what's the next picture we've got? We've got a fantastic kingfisher by Katie Close. And now Katie is trumping us all here because this actually visited her garden pond. So, Katie, I very much hope this kingfisher returns for your big garden bird watch. Now, I think that this kingfisher, I'm just having a close look at that beak because I think that's a male. So I think we say that the male has got an all black beak and from memory, uh, the female has a red mark on her lower, the lower part of her beak. Um, so that's a really lovely shot. They're very bright colours. Um, the next one is a starling. And what we didn't say about the uh, great tit earlier was that the great tit was number seven in last week's, last year's Big Garden Birdwatch Top 10. The starling, uh, this one uh, photographed by Jeff Douglas, was number two in last year's Big Garden Birdwatch Top 10. So they are seen in many, many gardens, but they're not doing particularly well, these, these birds, are they? No, they're not. And the weird thing about it is we don't know why. As I understand it, they're doing quite well when it comes to nesting and producing young, but then somewhere along the line, their numbers are, are declining and they're sort of disappearing, um, perhaps in their wintering sites. So it's really valuable to be getting this data. And from this clip, you can see this starling is just getting its kind of real iridescent shine to it, um, which you might notice at the moment, they're turning from that kind of dull, um, speckly brown color to that lovely glossy breeding plumage. And that one's got its eye on some blackberries. Um, I get plenty in the garden here and they are drawn in by mealworms. They cannot resist a mealworm. So um, that's a tip for keeping them going through the winter months. What's the next photo? Now this next one, Jamie, is from Elise Jones. And it's fantastic because just look at the paleness of one of these birds. I've never seen one like that myself. I don't know if you have. I have. I've seen, uh, well, I've, I've seen that sort of an, uh, it might have been a leucistic one or an albino one quite a long time ago, but 
this shot is just incredible because you can really see that comparison and we've talked before on notes on nature tv about leucistic birds and how unlike an albino they don't have that pink eye um, and this one you can see has a, the eyes pale but it's not it's not completely pink so this isn't an albino but and the contrast with the with the normally colored red kite is quite striking isn't it yeah i love that photo that's 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 the best one I've seen all year. That's fantastic. That <laughs> it's beautiful. So thank you, Elise. Thank you so much for sending that one in. We we really enjoy this one. Um, and we've got one last one here, which is another really striking shot. Um, and I had to include this one. Um, it's just stunning, isn't it? The the, the contrast of those colours and and the colours in this in this robin photo remind me a bit of the kingfisher. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I mean, who doesn't love a robin? My favourite robin fact ever is um that when they follow you around the garden like <laughs> there's some sort of pet um and following you particularly when you're doing some digging i had one in the allotment the other day it was really really close um obviously when i ever tried to get a photo of it it flew off but robins have evolved in the forests of europe they see us very much like they would do a, a deer or a wild boar grubbing up the earth and providing access to all those tasty worms so they basically just see us as an upright wild boar don't they <laughs> That's fantastic. I love that. The idea of everyone just grubbing around and the robin just thinks, oh, yeah, some sort of wild boar there. I don't know <laughs> yeah. about that. But yeah, um, what's also really cool about robins, I love, I mean, you can get really attached to them because often the one that you're seeing in your garden will be the same individual. because They're so territorial that they're not going to let another robin in their patch. So if you're seeing one all the time, it's probably the same little chap or chap S. And we do kind of think of them as our robins, don't they? That's 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 our robin in the garden. Yeah, it's it's just a, a lovely, familiar bird. And thank you, Joe. And thank you all for sending in those photos. Um, we had a tremendous response. We asked in Notes on Nature, the uh, weekly email we send out uh, the other day, if people would like to send their photos into us. And we had hundreds sent in um, and they are a joy to see. If you would like to send us anything for Notes on Nature TV, you can send it to our new email address. Uh, if you've got a wildlife photo or a video of some nature that you'd like us to feature, our email address is notesonnature at rspb.org.uk. Coming up, Miranda Krestoflikov introduces us to a pair of kestrels. Um, generally the females been using it overnight, the males been coming in just very briefly and then leaving, so really nice to see the two of them together. Oh, you can see that she's calling. Unfortunately we, haven't have any, we don't have any audio here, um, but you can see her um, beak opening and she's just calling to him, which is lovely. And the fabulous Mike Dilger enthuses about garden birds. I would think number one species in my garden is the goldfinch. It's a really easy bird to identify. It's got that target, the red, white and black face. But also when you see it coming in, it's got that lovely gold, that flash of gold. Now, here's another bird that often visits gardens and, and I often see one in my own garden, the grey wagtail. Hello, and in this species spotlight, we are taking a closer look at the grey wagtail. Now, this is a wonderful species that could occur in gardens in winter. Admittedly, it is a fairly scarce visitor, but they do turn up fairly frequently across the whole of the UK. And it's a bird that we often get told about because it is quite an unusual one. Now, it's also a species that causes uh, a few identification issues. So I thought I would initially clear that up. Now, grey wagtails are indeed quite grey, but they're also extremely yellow, as you can see in this clip here. Um, so they are grey above, but very yellow below. Um, but they do have an extremely long tail as well, which is always wagging, which is always a, a feature of any wagtail. Now, the confusion species is the yellow wagtail. And as we can see here, it is much more yellow. Um, females are greeny yellow above and yellow below, but males are very, very yellow. And it's actually yellow wagtails that are often confused with the grey wagtails. Now, to help further, yellow wagtails are actually only summer visitors. So currently in the UK, there wouldn't be any yellow wagtails around, except actually, just to confuse things, there is one called an Eastern yellow wagtail currently in the UK, but that is one single bird and they are mega, mega rare. So not one to worry about. So it just adds to confusion. But yellow wagtails, like I say, are summer visitors and they'll be arriving in April and leaving again in about September. So at this time of year, you're only really likely to see the grey wagtail. Now, of course, there is a third species of wagtail in Britain, the pied wagtail. Um, but I suspect we're much more familiar with this bird. We see it around our town centres an awful lot, maybe even in your garden if you're lucky too. But they are, uh, as the name suggests, very black and white. So that's the pied wagtail. 
So grey wagtails, like I say, sometimes visit gardens, um, but it is only in winter. And why is that? Well, this is a river species. It's a bird that spends most of its life on rivers, but in the wintertime, rivers become swollen and flooded. And that means food is hard to find. So gardens become a bit of a, a, bit of a last resort when they can't feed on rivers anymore. They head to our gardens and around our houses to find some food. So a little bit of a refuge uh, whilst uh, times are tough during the winter. Now, keep an eye out over the next few months because it'll be March or April when they'll be heading back to their rivers. So do keep an eye out uh, over the Big Garden Birdwatch, of course, um, but generally for the next few months, because if you do spot one, trust me, it will be a real treat. So good luck. So can you attract grey whitetails to your garden? Well, it's a good question. They're not something you can easily draw in by putting out bird feed. What they do seem to like, though, is ponds. And I've had the experience and our wildlife gardener, um, Adrian Thomas has also had this where soon after you put a pond in the grey white will pop in to investigate which is interesting because we see them mostly as, as birds of um, kind of fast flowing upland streams uh, the same kind of habitat where you find interesting other um, waterside um, and almost aquatic birds are uh, the dipper I'm thinking of but grey wagtails will come into gardens and, and certainly in, in our suburban garden they, they do pop in and there's been one um, yesterday hopping around the lawn all day. Have you ever uh, encountered one of these Jenny? Oh I wish, no, we've, um, we get another type of wagtail which I have to say is no less stunning and that's the pied wagtail, often seen scuttling along um, car parks and playgrounds. Um, yeah they're lovely um, to watch and we're really hoping that the pair that live around us might nest this spring. Oh, fingers crossed. You have to let us know. Come, come back on Notes on Nature TV and give us an update. Uh, yeah. I love a pie wagtail with that. Um, and we're talking about the great tip call earlier on, which is easily remembered. But pie wagtail as well. Um, Chiswick is, is, is the noise they make. They, they all come <laughs> from Chiswick, apparently. Um, so talking of garden birds um, the RSPB's big garden bird watch is coming up very soon and you can join in from Friday the 29th to Sunday the 31st of January. I caught up with Scala Radio's uh, Simon Mayer who is a big fan of birds to have a chat about it. Simon welcome. Yes. Hello um, what are your favourite garden birds? I'm not sure that the birds that I'm going to say are going to count as garden birds because <laughs> in fact I know in fact I know they don't and they're not here yet but all the time that I spend out uh, in the garden <clears throat> enjoying the time there I have a tiny garden you know it's like it's like this big um what all all it makes me do is make me yearn for the time when the swifts are back so that's so that's so that's what they all make me think because the swifts and their and the swallows, they just uh, are birds that are, they, I mean, they have a, a very unusual cry, but every time they appear, they make, they make me feel very joyful. So um, I'm going to, my most boring answer would be blackbird, because I love the fact that they're so common, and yet they have the greatest song of all. I mean, I, I know there are other songbirds that can probably be more show-offy, but I love the blackbird probably more than any other but i just it just all of the time i'm spending out there i'm waiting for the swifts and maybe i'll look up and see if want to sneak down slightly earlier though it seems a long way off at the moment it does and, and actually that's a brilliant answer because you've given two there one which we can look forward to seeing right now um, and one that we can we can plan and hope for in the future and, and obviously now is a cracking time for people to get up their swifts nest boxes as well so yes um, i've got one I have one. I have one up there, and it's been studiously ignored by, <laughs> by all Swifts every single year. But I'm hopeful that this year maybe. The the trick supposedly is to play the sound of a Swift, but um, I, I don't know how easy that is to do. But you can have a recording that blasts out the the screaming. Um, so I know some people sort of poise themselves by their window when they see a Swift flying over. They press a button and desperately try and call it down. But fingers crossed, this will be the year. <laughs> I don't think I'll be I don't think I'll be doing that, but I have heard that that works. <laughs> and what are you most looking forward to about this year's Big Garden Bird Watch? Well, I subscribe to the Simon Barnes theory here. Uh, Simon, who's a, a, a great sports writer, but a great lover of nature and a great birder, 
as well. And he wrote, I think it was on the front cover of his book, How to Be a Bad Bird Watcher. And, he ju- and I think he wrote, I think it just says at the bottom, the strap line is, to the greater glory of life or something like that. Words to that effect. And I think that's what it's, the, I think that's what they're there for. It's just the fact that they're there. If I don't know which bird they are, it kind of annoys me, but also it doesn't matter because just sitting there uh, wrapped up very well um, may, is, is a joyful thing. There are very few things that we're allowed to do <laughs> that bring us joy um, at the moment. So this is something to look forward to because I think you can just sit quietly, study, watch, learn, be happy. That's it. Brilliant stuff from Simon Mayo there. I'm a Scala listener myself, actually, and I have to say, classical music in the background while you're doing your big garden bird watch, that just sounds like the perfect soundtrack, the perfect morning. I love a blackbird too, actually, and I have a fact for you here, Jamie. Why is a blackbird called a blackbird? Well, I'm going to give you the obvious answer. <laughs> is it because the male is black? <laughs> well, yes, but then a crow is also a blackbird. So it's actually because the word bird used to refer just to small birds, so the ones that we kind of refer to as a passerine now, um, to define it against anything sort of larger. So, yeah, it wasn't the sort of general term that it is today. So the word blackbird would have been a description of both its colour and its relatively small size. That's incredible. Thank you so much. That's our fact of, fact of the episode, <laughs> that one. Um, that's absolutely cracking. Thank you very much for that. And we'll have more on Big Garden Birdwatch later with Mike Dilger. Now, a couple of weeks ago, TV broadcaster and RSPB president Miranda Krestovnikov introduced us to the kestrels that visit her kestrel box. Last time we got to see the male bird. Well, now he's been joined by the female. So we've got the male kestrel at the back of the nest box and the female has just flown in now. Um, I haven't seen the two of them in the nest box together for about two or three weeks, so this is really exciting. Um, Generally, the female's been using it overnight. The male's been coming in just very briefly and then leaving, so really nice to see the two of them together. Oh, you can see that she's calling. Unfortunately, we we don't have any audio here, um, but you can see her um, beak opening and she's just calling to him, which is lovely. I think he's calling back as well. So they're just establishing that pair bond that they've had probably over the last year. So if I went out of my front door now, I'd be able to hear them calling, but I wouldn't understand necessarily where they were. I wouldn't even know, probably, because it's dark now, that they're actually in the nest box together. Um, But having this monitor in our kitchen gives us a really clear view of exactly what's happening and the behaviour that's going on inside. Neither bird seems to bring in any prey to the box at the moment, so during the day they're out hunting and feeding out around and about where we live. Um, And at night they just seem to come in and use the box for shelter, Uh, presumably a bit of uh, warmth at this time of year and uh, just a bit of shelter out of the wind. Great views of those kestrels there. Now, Jenny, your team works quite a lot with birds of prey. I don't know if if that's necessarily kestrels, but that's quite a big part of your job, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Um, I work in the RSPB's investigations team, which is basically about detecting and preventing the illegal killing of raptors, also known as birds of prey. So it's a really sad fact for all of us who love birds um, and really sort of celebrate seeing them in our skies. There are some people who are illegally and systematically killing them and removing them from certain landscapes, particularly in the uplands of the UK. Um, And unfortunately, in my home county of North Yorkshire, this is the worst place for raptor persecution. And the biggest problem is on grouse moors, which are managed intensively to support the highest possible density of red grouse in order for those birds to be commercially shot. Uh, The problem arises is that predators like birds of prey, which may impact on the number of birds, are routinely killed. Now this is illegal and we actually saw a big upsurge of this uh, during the first spring lockdown. So now that we're back in lockdown again, there's a bit of a concern that people are going to be back out there ramping up their efforts to kill birds of prey now that there's nobody watching. But our team is still out there doing a fantastic job 
monitoring the hills and looking out for any wrongdoing, so rest assured. Your team do amazing work, Jenny, and helping to raise the profile of this problem as well is quite important because now that we are really getting the word out there, people are getting in touch with you when they see anything suspicious, aren't they? Yeah, they are absolutely, which is fantastic. I mean, not all that many people are aware that this is happening, but I think that is starting to change and people are keeping their eyes peeled and um, reporting these things to us. So please do, if you notice a dead bird of prey or an injured bird of prey in sort of suspicious circumstances, it's worth picking up the phone and calling either ourselves and also the police on 101. And just to reiterate that we're so, so grateful um, for the support of, of our members. We literally couldn't do this work without you. So um, please be aware of every day we do this work. We're, we're very, very grateful for you guys. Um, so, yes, thank you so much for all the support that you give the RSPB because it allows us to do this kind of work. And there's more information on how to join the RSPB on our website, rspb.org.uk slash join. Like Simon Mayo, and indeed all of us, Mike Dilger is really looking forward to Big Garden Birdwatch from the 29th to the 31st of January. I caught up with him to find out more about the birds in his garden and what he's been doing during lockdown. Right. Hello, Mike. Welcome to Notes on Nature TV. Thank you very, very much for joining us. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how brilliant it is to be able to watch birds from the window uh, as part of Big Garden Birdwatch, but in general as well. It really adds a wonderful kind of lift to your day, doesn't it? I've been confined to barracks. I've been stuck in headquarters at home. But what I have found is that, that wildlife is an enormous solace to me. Um, when I can't go out looking at it in every single corner of the British Isles, I'm lucky enough, I should say, to have a garden. It's not a huge garden. It's about the size of a tennis court. And I have lots of feeders in it. And I have a kitchen with lots of glass at the back that looks out onto my garden. And I cannot tell you the enjoyment that I've had out of watching birds in my garden over the last year. I mean, it's literally been my saving grace. It's basically my fix of wildlife has been watching the bullfinches coming in, the goldfinches, the chaffinches. I've got a very rural garden, so I get loads of finches in my garden. And breakfast, lunch, dinner, I sit there with a view, with the birds coming in, and it is getting me through this terrible pandemic. So watching birds, whilst it's an amazing hobby, actually it's a very, very good second best watching them purely in your own garden. So I am lucky to have a garden and um, they really have helped me through what is a really tough time for everyone. It, it sounds like they are really brightening your day. Now you talked a bit about finches there. Shall we give the viewers a few tips on um, telling if some of those finches apart? Are there, are there two or three perhaps that people get confused? Um, I'm very lucky that I get a wide diversity of, of birds into my garden. I think last year I did the RSB with Big Garden Birdwatch and I had 27 species. Wow, in that's one amazing. Hour, which is amazing. We had a sparrow hawk coming in going for the birds. So. I am lucky, but I think probably finches are the most common birds. I would think number one species in my garden is the goldfinch. It's a really easy bird to identify. It's got that target, the red, white and black face. But also when you see it coming in, it's got that lovely gold, that flash of gold in the wings. But the other two that come really commonly into the garden are greenfinch. Greenfinch, bigger, more bullheaded big straw coloured bill. The males actually are, are beautiful. Uh, the females are a bit duller and more obscure, but it's, it's a finch really on steroids. And I'm lucky because loads of people have had problems with green finches coming into their garden because of this disease, trichomonosis. Uh, but that doesn't seem to uh, have afflicted the green finches near where I live. So green finches are really common, but my favourite bird, Jamie, has to be the bullfinch. And it's a bird I always hear before I see. It's got a call. And once you learn that call, you know it's coming in. I've actually had three individual male bullfinches on the feeder at one time. And of course, the males have got that massive big pink breast and, and the kind of black cap. And the females are a dull kind of gray brown washed out version. version. But the lovely thing as well is the bullfinch always flies off, leaving you wanting more. And as it whizzes off, what just hits you in the eye 
like the gold in the goldfinch's wings is that massive big white rump. So it flies off and you see that white rump, bullfinch. So my garden is a finch garden. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. There's three birds to look out for there. Uh, now, Mike, what would you say to someone who's considering taking part in Big Garden Birdwatch for the first time this year? It's a brilliant way of, of spending an hour. Um, put some, you know, most people feed their garden birds. I mean, if you've not got a fancy feeder like me with sunflower hearts and fat blocks, you can even put bacon rind out, cooked rice, bits of bread, and just uh, what I've done is I've printed out this. Fortunately, my family is quite lucky because they've got a know-it-all in the house, <laughs> i.e. me. So we don't need one of these. But these are probably 90% of the birds that will come into the garden. So sign up, um, print off the sheet, and it's really easy. All you do is you sit there for an hour going, blue tit, robin, blackbird, song thrush, and it's wonderful. And if you see six goldfinch at the same time, you can count those six goldfinch. So it's a really brilliant way of, of getting people turned onto wildlife on their own doorstep. And let's not forget, of course, it's a citizen science at its best, really wonderful. And the RSPB are using this data to see how the trends of birds are going. I mean, House Sparrow and Starling are the top two. I never see them in my garden. I'm too busy seeing finches. So they're using that data to monitor the garden birds that we know best. And it was the RSPB Garden Bird Watch that found out that song thrushes were on this massive decline. So I think the data that they're collecting is invaluable. What we get out of it is an immense amount of enjoyment for an hour. It's the ultimate win-win scenario. Now, one way of getting plenty of wild visitors in your garden is to make them feel at home. Here's Adrian Thomas with a suggestion. You'll often hear me going on about the importance of a log pile for wildlife which is great when you've got something like this, which I can see is covered in springtails and woodlice and millipedes. But what if you don't have logs? Well, the thing is that a stick pile is just as good for wildlife. You can be as creative as you want to, you can make it as big as you want to, and you're bound to have some lying around or when you're doing prunings, just gather them up, put them in a pile, add to it month on month, year on year, and you'll be creating a home for all sorts of wildlife. For me, this is a place where my wrens breed and where my dunnocks sing. And who knows what frogs and toads and newts live away under there during the winter. So go on, get sticking as well as logging. That was brilliant there from Adrian, always full of sage advice, bit of a gardening um, pun there. Um, building a pile of sticks if you don't have logs is great. As Adrian says, he's getting birds nesting there. He's getting probably all sorts of things, woodlice, spiders, ladybirds hibernating. They really are wonderful little habitats. And I've been trying to build a few of those in my own garden. And Jenny, you've been doing the same, I think. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we can all sort of treat our gardens like a bit of a mini nature reserve and I've been leaving a patch of my grass to grow long and yeah, planting all sorts of things that are good for pollinators. And it's just so rewarding as well when you start to get the insects and then the birds coming in. So definitely 100% advise doing anything like that. And stay tuned to Notes on Nature TV for more wildlife gardening advice in the future. So we hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please remember to like us, subscribe if you're on YouTube. You can follow us if you're on IGTV. And let us know in the comments if there's anything you'd like us to cover in future episodes. Thanks for watching.